Hey Spartan fans, this is Jim Comperoni, publisher of SpartanMag.com, inviting you to become a member of the SpartanMag.com community today. There is no better time to subscribe and become a Spartan Magger than right now. For a limited time, you will get 25% off on your annual subscription to SpartanMag.com, which is part of the Rivals.com national network. Subscribe today and you will receive a $75 digital Nike gift card redeemable online and at all Nike outlets while supplies last. So basically, we are paying you to become a subscriber. So go on over to SpartanMag.com, look for the breaking red banner at the top of the page for details on how to get started. Come on aboard, get online, become a Spartan Mag member, and you will get unmatched analytical coverage and commentary on Michigan State football, basketball, and recruiting from contributors such as Paul Konadike, Rico Beard, Ricardo Cooney, recruiting insider Corey Robinson, and myself, Jim Comperoni. We even do a little bit of Michigan State hockey. Remember the glory days? We got you covered over there at SpartanMag.com. Plus, you will get access to the VCasts, the Skull Session podcasts, the Recruiting Rap podcast, the Final Forum basketball message board, and the Underground Bunker message board, which is the best forum for Spartan fans anywhere on the internet. Subscribe now and become part of the number one online community of Michigan State fans, SpartanMag.com. Do it today and you get 25% off, which comes out to about $6 a month for your subscription. And you will have full access to SpartanMag.com and get the $75 digital Nike gift card. Do it today. Become a magger. Subscribe to SpartanMag.com. Go to SpartanMag.com. Look for the breaking red banner at the top of the page for details on how to get started. This offer will not last long, so take advantage of it and join SpartanMag.com today. And welcome once again to the SpartanMag.com VCast. Jim Comperoni, Paul Konerdijk talking Michigan State football recruiting on signing day 2019 for the 2020 recruiting class. Normally we would do the VCast on site, on location, immediately after the press conference, but I had to get away today. Uh, had you know, just a little, little daughter situation, a little uh, pick her up from school, sick type of situation. Had to get going, and we were not able to do the VCast there at Spartan Stadium. But I told Paul, hold his thoughts. We will do it podcast style, and uh, we'll deliver the VCast here a few hours later. But still getting a lot of the same points across as Michigan State comes out of. Signing day, ranked number 34 in the country in the Rivals.com rankings, number 8 in the Big Ten. Paul Konerdike, how you doing, man? I know it's been a long day for you. Thanks for all your help. Are you hanging in there? Do we still have you? Yeah, you still have me. I'm just a little bit eggnogged up right now, so I might make my points more vociferously. I guess if I can say vociferously, I'm not too eggnogged up, but... Dude, Miss Hemingway was, was better at this stuff after a few 7 or 8 or 10 of, the, of some high balls. Maybe maybe yeah. that's maybe that's what I need. Maybe that would help my craft a little bit. Yeah, I think it's more like six toed cats. I think yeah, that's what we do it. Does your son still call it egg knob? No, no. Oh, that's too bad. Unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. My, a little bit of background on that. My son Sam, who's now twelve, is probably embarrassed <laughs> if he knew I was talking about him. He used to walk around yelling random things at random times, and one of the things was egg knob. That's good. And pancakes. I, I really wish he'd do that more uh, because. It'd be a little bit more charming. Did you put any spirits in the eggnog? Yeah, yeah, a little bit of Southern Comfort, a little bit of nutmeg. Yeah. And it's all good. Deck the halls, man. You got If you're going to roll <laughs> with the eggnog and you're going to liquor it up, you got to put the nutmeg in there. Otherwise, it's terrible. Dude, I already like the VCAS better this way. All right, let's go. All right, recruiting. Michigan State signed 20. They're still after one or two or three more. They're taking a look at the transfer portal. I know you've been keeping an eye on this class a little bit, and you, you, you saw what D'Antonio had to say today. They did not show any video at the press conference today. Usually there's a few highlights from the most recent season that I've not seen on Huddle. And I look forward to those highlights in recruiting day, just because that's the way it's always been. No highlights today. Uh, actually, not a lot of stats in the uh, information packet we were given either. So it's kind of a discount signing day for Michigan State this year. 
let me let me just weigh in on that. One of the guys that I wanted to know how many how many yards he put up was Montori Foster. So yeah, I know exactly. He had a hundred. I know they had a hundred yards and something, and yeah. two touchdown catches exactly. against Cass Tech. So that's interesting. And I know he was first team or second team All Ohio at the Division One level, which says a lot for a kid that's never played that hasn't played varsity football until his senior year. But I'd kind of like to know. Uh, what his total stats were because yes. because I think there's a big di- here's the thing you know I haven't covered high school sports for a long time before I started covering college sports there's a really big difference when you look at what receivers do when they go from that 400 yard 500 yard season mm-hmm. to that mm-hmm. you know 700 to 800 yard season and mm-hmm. then up to what we saw from uh, a couple other guys guys like uh, Ricky White wow and uh, you know and Terry Lockett where those guys were Ricky White having uh 1600 yards in Terry Lockett having 1300 yards. I don't think people realize uh, maybe how hard it is to put up the kind of numbers that those two dudes had at the, at the high school level. I know they're throwing the ball around a lot more, but it's pretty rare to see guys go up over a thousand yards with double digit touchdowns in high school football. I agree, and I looked for those stats also and was also disappointed to not find them. I tried to DM him a couple of weeks ago to get stats, didn't get back to me. Ian Stewart, four or five weeks ago, I asked him to send his stats. And he's like, yeah, sure, I'll ask my coach. I'll get those to you. And he he never did. And his stats were not in the packet today either. Now, his stats would have been rushing stats because he played quarterback in a T, wing T type of offense. But still, it would have been been nice to get those stats. And, uh, you know, as far as uh, Ricky White goes out of Georgia, what do you have? Ninety-seven catches, Paul. I've never seen that before yeah, on Sunday. Ninety-six, ninety-six catches. And I, I told you a little bit earlier. I mean, I, we were like on the road somewhere, and we were talking about some of the receivers in this class, and kind of like, you know, do do you how much do you really know about these guys? Because we didn't, you don't know a lot. And I had heard from a couple of people I know down in Georgia that um, you just follow high school sports down there that Ricky White was having a big big senior season and then lo and behold to, to put up those numbers at the at the 7a level and i think what people need to realize is when you play at a school as big as marietta in uh, in a state that is as good as georgia is in terms of in terms of putting out uh college football talent you are going to be you know you're going to be going up against college level defensive backs on a weekend week out basis that's just the way it is down there and uh, for him to put up those kind of season those kind of stats for him to win the state championship at the 7a level uh that says a lot about about who you know maybe what he can do and the other thing about those guys from georgia and i think one of the things you're seeing a lot more of with michigan state targeting some of the skill players is they get a chance to see those guys in spring football and uh you know when i talk to assistant coaches uh, and if I was to talk to a uh, you know defensive backs coach or or even Dave Warner who was recruiting those guys, he'd always talk about seeing those guys early on in spring football, knowing that they fit the fit the profile of what Michigan State's looking for, passing that information on to the position coach, and then following up that way. I think that's the one advantage you get with a guy with guys from Georgia. But to see those guys look, you know, show out in the spring. <laughs> generate interest and then go out and do it during during the season against top notch opponents that, that says you know that says a lot for those guys absolutely and like you said he did it for an outstanding marietta team against great competition when they were throwing him those 97 receptions i mean it's not like Ithaca blowing teams out 50 to nothing every week. I mean, they're going against good competition. Every possession counts. Every reception counts. And he lit up his senior season. I made that point in the article that I wrote earlier today that that is – I mean, if Ricky White turns out to be a really good college player and maybe even an outstanding one, let's say he's all Big Ten, let's say he has like, I don't know, a Keith Mumphrey-type career or better, that'll go down as a tremendous recruiting job by Michigan State to – analyze him and recognize his talent before anyone else did chad simmons who covers georgia recruiting for rivals.com and we've had him on the recruiting wrap in the past he made a comment after watching ricky white in the state championship this weekend that uh that that was a great recruiting job by michigan state because georgia state was hoping to keep ricky white quiet back in may well news got out michigan state watched him in spring practice like you said offered him enticed him to come on campus for an an official visit in June. Another thing that would not have been possible three years ago, the new NCAA rules, official visits in the spring and summer. You get a Georgia kid on campus in June. He likes it. And then a little bit later, commits to Michigan State, I think, in in the early fall, I think it might have been. From that point on, then he blew up 
for a very good team. From that point on, you had to hold off Tennessee and a lot of other Johnny-come-latelys trying to get in line for him. To his credit, to Michigan State's credit, recruiting at that point became a, a, a situation of fanning away at other people trying to get into your lunch there a little bit. And honestly, Paul, when it was October, November, and he was rolling up big numbers for a great team, he was committed to Michigan State. But I was thinking to myself, confidence meter, um, you know, 67% chance he ends up being a Spartan. But you know what? He never even took an, another official visit. Like D'Antonio said, this guy has, I think, Akron or Dayton roots. Midwest. Yeah, he said Dayton. Dayton says. Okay, so Midwestern guy. This guy stuck to it, and um, that's a that's a that's a tr- tremendous recruiting job from start to finish. Not just selling a kid in a living room, but from the beginning, that's textbook how Michigan State needs to get it done in a state like Georgia. Get down there early, make some great evaluations, get them on campus, pitch a perfect game for about six or seven innings, and then hold on. That's not a bad way to do it, Paul. No, and D'Antonio mentioned somewhat, somewhat along those lines today. He talked about with the new recruiting rules where you can have guys on, on campus for official visits early, which you can use as a tool to get those guys up there when they're juniors. But the, the, the key after that is to maintain that relationship. And, uh, you know, so to your point, uh, when you get those guys up there early, you really have to maintain that relationship. And uh, I mean, they, did a, they did a really good job with, with it. And I think, you know, going along the same lines with the receiving, receiving class, I, I do like the way Michigan State did this receiving class because they've got guys in there that fit that traditional, like Michigan, Michigan State, the, the athlete guy they look for, uh, you know, with the Ian Stewart, a guy that's played multiple sports, plays multiple positions in high school or ha- has played multiple positions for, for football. You know, they recruited him as an athlete to play, play receiver, possibly play other positions. Um, also going after Terry Lockett, one of those kind of multi-position guys that could either play wide receiver or, or corner. But then they're still staying proactive and in, in being, uh, you know, kind of having their feelers out and uh, taking getting a, uh, like a hot stock tip uh, with Montori Foster. And, uh, you know, he looked like a, you know, he looked like a real reach early on. But, yeah. you know, at the same time, you look at what Michigan State has done. You look at what they've been successful doing, and they have had, they have been successful in part because they've been willing to maybe uh, you know put in for a guy like a Benny Fowler, a guy like a Keyshawn Martin, uh, before those guys were really uh, widely known. And uh, and I think that's something that Michigan State they have to you know they have to stay aware. Uh, and, and keep on, on the lookout for those super sleepers. The other thing with Ohio, and you and I talked about this, um, you know, after the press conference, M- Michigan State um, has about as good as of network of informants in Ohio as you could, as you could hope for. Um, maybe they don't have the people pushing them, uh, players to go there like Ohio State does, but Michigan State gets good information. So generally, when they get those sleeper guys out of out of Ohio, those guys more often than not, those guys point, those guys pan out because. High school coaches are uh, down in Ohio. They're knowledgeable, and uh, and they know what Michigan State's looking for, and they don't blow smoke for the most part. And uh, I think that stood out to me when Dan Tony was talking about Montori Foster. You know, was the fact that you know obviously he watched him play basketball, but I think Dan Tony, uh, you know, he wanted to make the point, and he made it kind of subtly that he was impressed with how physical that Montori Foster was as a blocker, and that's something that I don't think he expected for a kid coming to coming to high school football as late as, as he did in the in the in the process but that'll be a kid to watch because um you know he, he'll probably be a guy we forget about and uh, you know we'll hear hey this guy's flashing maybe he won't maybe he won't do anything but uh michigan state got some guys in this, in this receiver class at least the people wanted they got some guys that um you know were versatile maybe fit other positions and you know they stay true to to who they've been in the past and what's been successful for them by keeping their keeping their eyes and ears open for for one of those under the radar type of guys that might be able to help them out and uh it'll be interesting to see what what happens i think the fact that that foster plays basketball um you know both foster and lockett have something in common in that they play uh you know they play for two of the better high school basketball programs um in the country and, uh, and, you know, just like Elijah Collins playing at, at UD Jesuit in Detroit, you don't get to be in the starting lineup at those schools without being tremendous athletes, first and foremost. But um, so those guys will, will be interesting to, to watch. I think with Montori Foster, the biggest thing would be, is he going to be physical enough? How long is it going to take for him to be developed at physicality? If he's shown a knack for run blocking or, or for, I'm sorry, for 
for blocking in general, that's a, that's a good sign. It, and frankly, you're not going to play much at at St. Ed's if you're not doing what you need to do at wide receiver, and that includes being physical. A really interesting group of wide receivers, and they needed it this year. Like you said in your article at SpartanMag.com, Michigan State just a few weeks ago it looked like they were razor thin at wide receiver and that was a time when they offered Montori Foster and that looked really curious at the time and I need to send off the buzzer right now because I know there's a lot of people out there that think that uh, that they are they're concerned about sunshine blowing that we're glossing over making it sound too good trying to put lipstick on a pig and all that because and I need to voice uh and I need I need to acknowledge those people because there are a lot of subscribers and non-subscribers that are upset with the program the direction of the program they think the sky not only is falling but has fallen I and I and I and I respect their opinions I mean um I I agree that it's not been pretty the last four years and I agree recruiting on the offensive side of the ball for the first three quarters of this recruiting cycle was worrisome but I do think in my opinion just this reporter's opinion. I do think Michigan State salvaged the class uh, in in a lot of regards. They still have some some work to do, but I just want to acknowledge that there are people out there that think this class was a disaster. And you know, on the underground bunker message board, there were people that were really jumping off the cliff because a few people, a few outlets, ranked Michigan State number nine in the Big Ten with this recruiting class, or number ten in this recruiting class. Um, and I made a post about twenty minutes ago here as we get toward midnight. Um, and I'll, I'll go over some of the points in that one that, okay, Michigan State's class right now is number 34 in the country. And in a lot of ways, this recruiting class is very similar to many other past Michigan State recruiting classes. You know, um, in, in the past, let's see, I've got it written down here. You know, I, I, I think I've lost, let's see. I've, okay, of, Mich- of D'Antonio's 13 recruiting classes, he's had five classes that have been in the top 26. And he's had four classes that have ranked like this one in the mid to low 30s. And he's had four classes ranked outside of the top 40. So this is squarely a middling recruiting class for Mark D'Antonio. Not one of his four best, not one of his four worst. Okay, so it's the usual D'Antonio type of class. And Michigan State has won championships with some classes like this, and they've also gone 500 in the last four years with classes like this. So trying to tell the difference between past classes that were in the 30s and this one, um, hard to do. A lot of that's going to come down to quality control at the top with the assistant coaches, the head coach. It's going to come down to, well, how good was their evaluation? Because if you've got the 34-ranked class, you are betting that your 34-ranked class is better than the team that was ranked 32. And you're going to be a top 15 team, whereas someone who's 31 or 30 might end up being a top 40 team because your evaluation is better. That's just the way coaches have to think. Not that they care much about these rankings. They do in terms of public relations, but not in terms of uh, you know trying to... I, I'm just making an analogy there. Now, so Michigan State's been 34 around that area a lot of times. Here's the difference. This year, usually number 34 in the Big Ten will place you 5th or 6th, maybe 7th in the Big Ten. This year, it's 8th or ninth because Minnesota's recruiting better than usual. Purdue, for a second straight year, is recruiting better than usual. Maryland is ahead of Michigan State. And then Iowa's ahead of them and Wisconsin are. Usually, Wisconsin and Iowa are somewhere outside of number 35. This year, all five of those programs are 34 to 26. So, Michigan State's same old 34 class for people out there. Just, you know, don't jump off on any, any cliffs. It's number 8 in the Big Ten this year. It would have been number five in the Big Ten other years. And I can, just looking at the numbers, last year, I looked at the Rivals.com numbers. Last year, number 34 would have been number seven in the Big Ten. The year before, 2018, number 34 would have been number six in the Big Ten. And that's exactly where Michigan State was in 2018. In 2017, number 34 would have been number six in the Big Ten. And again, that's exactly where Michigan State was. 2016, number 34 would have would have been number six in the Big Ten again. And actually, Wisconsin was number six in the Big Ten at number 35 that year in 2016. And look where their, their program is this year. And we know what Michigan State was ranked in 2016. Real high, and that class went off the, off the deep end. All right, two more point, points. 2015, number 34 would have been ranked number five in the Big Ten. And Wisconsin was actually number five in the Big Ten that year at number 37. And I could go on and on, 2014, 2013. My point, 
I've said this is a basic D'Antonio recruiting class, and it is regardless of what people are telling you or what, regardless of your reaction to what it means to your <laughs> self-worth or whatever because Michigan State is 8 or 9 in the Big Ten. That might have hurt your feelings at the water cooler at work. I don't know, but it's the same usual D'Antonio type of recruiting class. Paul, does any of that make sense to you? Yeah, because you go back to look at D'Antonio's first top 25 class in 2009. You know, that was that was a class that had frankly a bunch of overrated in-state players in it that really didn't pan out and it was light on it was light on defensive linemen but that was that was one that a lot of people felt really good about and uh to me i i really personally and i've you and i've talked about this a lot over the years and it's really hard for me to to feel much different about the class that's ranked 26 nationally anywhere between 26 and 40 there's really not a whole lot of difference yeah. between those guys when it comes down to it and i think what I'm, what I look at, and what I want to see in each class is: Do you have quality? I mean, first off, are you addressing your needs? And I think that's something that's first and foremost uh, something that has to be done every year. I think Michigan State addresses needs at, at, at wide receiver, but I think the true value of the class, in a lot of ways, is de- is dependent on what you do on the defensive line. Are you bringing in guys that can play end? Are you bringing in guys that will keep the tackle position going? And if some of those guys don't, are they going to fill other positions? So when I look at Michigan State's class, if I, if I was going to be uh, hand-wringing, I'd be hand-wringing because I thought they really failed miserably uh, bringing in defensive linemen. That is the one, to, to me, true barometer about toward it, when it comes to stability in a program. And, and I say that because, you know, when you look at some of the classes that John L. Smith signed uh, before Mark D'Antonio arrived on campus, they had such a hard time bringing in defensive linemen and I think that's one of the things that it led to some of that inconsistency um you know throughout throughout that that era um I think Michigan State if you continue to send good offensive line or good defensive linemen I think you're you're doing a lot of a lot of your job and you know as far as going back to the wide receivers thing I, I don't think that's blowing you know I don't think that's blowing sunshine because you and I said in every single VCAS that we did this year that Michigan State didn't have Michigan State standard uh, skill players, mm-hmm. and uh, and we we're I mean that's something that was consistent. So I'm not trying to sell anybody a bill of goods. My point in the article that I wrote was that Michigan State brought in some good young talent at wide receiver uh, this year, and they also have some guys that are playing better than I expected them to. When you look at a guy like Trey Mosley coming on strong, uh, you know when you look at Jalen Naylor coming back from injury, I mean and Cody White pulling his head out of his backside and playing like he should have been playing all season long because he's got to be the guy now that Daryl Stewart's not, not there. Uh, so that's not sunshine blowing. That's uh, that's uh, some reality out there. When you look at Michigan State, has gotten better at receiver with some of those young guys coming on. Julian Barnett's, you know, yeah, he can only play limited positions at, at wide receiver now, but he'll be a multi-position player by next year. But he's got some, he's got some ability. You know, Trey Mosley, I mentioned, Jalen Naylor, Cody White coming back, uh, Jaden Daniels, um, you know, who's a big time explosive player who's done it in college already at Western Michigan. He's going to be a, he's going to be a factor for Michigan State um, next year. You know, who knows what's going to happen with guys like CJ Hayes and stuff like that. But there's guys that have been in the program that have played meaningful snaps. And, you know, when you get the body of work um, that guys like Barnett and uh, Mosley had this year it's not much of a big jump for those guys to go around the next year and have a, you know, and have a, like a jump that we've like to be in a very productive um, game in game out type of receiver. And now so if you, if you, if you have like a Felton Davis, or when you look at what Felton Davis did his first year, you know, he had a couple catches and then, you know, he becomes a good player. Tony Lippett, uh, he, he develops, Benny Fowler, he develops. I mean, so these guys have done it on the field and, you know, my, the point of my art, article, the article was that, hey, they got some good talent coming in, guys that are performing better at their senior years than maybe you anticipated they were. And the guys in the program are either, in the case of Cody White, stepping up like he should have or getting better in the case of Mosley and, uh, you know, in, you know, Jalen Naylor and those guys. So I don't, I don't think that's sun, that sunshine blowing. At the, at the end of the day, people are going to believe what they want. They're Absolutely. going to make whatever they're going to make that 34 ranking fit whatever narrative they want it to fit. So if they want to feel like this guy is falling and that the, the program is over with and that there has to be wholesale change, guess what? That 34 is going to be the worst 34 of all time. 
um, you know, I, to me, it comes down to a few things. It comes down to are you meeting your recruiting needs? How does this class mesh with the class before? And what I mean by that is, okay, you signed a lot of offensive linemen last year. Those guys are playing. They, those, so what are you doing this year? you got to sign, sign defensive linemen. And, uh, you know, so I, I think that that goes to it. And I think, you know, in terms of receiver, are, are you bringing in some of those in, in, in the kind of in-space playmakers that you need that you've been lacking in, in past years? And, then, you know, you look at a guy like Terry Lockett, what he was able to do on, on bubble screens, and they play very good competition at, at his school, which is a co-op of strong Catholic schools. Uh, but, you know, averaging 23 yards a catch, being an explosive guy. So that's not sunshine blowing. I think that's uh, that's all, like, it's not, it's, it's just all speculation. Um, but there are some tea leaves that point in the positive direction in, in a lot of things. Um, I think there's a lot of guys in, in, in this pro in this class that maybe, you know, maybe they're not, they don't get a ton of buzz, but that are going to be pretty good players. And, uh, you know, I think maybe if we talk about the defensive line next, you'll see some guys out, out there. You, you look at the, the kid from Indiana, Kyle King, mm-hmm. That uh, you know, I don't care what he's ranked, but I, I've seen a lot of top ten players in Indiana that aren't anything that, out of Indiana that aren't anything close to what he is um, in years past, and, and he's a good player. And uh, and I think some of the some of the, you know the defensive linemen, Simeon Barrow, I think he's good. Um, you know, I think there's some promise in this class. I'm not and surprised that I'm not surprised that Dan, I'm, I'm not surprised that Antonio mentioned that Simeon Barrow could be a defensive tackle he's listed as a defensive tackle you know he was a defensive end in a lot of the recruiting rankings when I looked at his film I'm like I don't know I don't think he has the takeoff and the the bend of the corner to be a defensive end but could you know add some beef to his frame like Joel Heath did and move inside that's what I thought and that's what I posted on the board back when Michigan State offered him and then Michigan State as I, I thought might happen, listed him as a defensive tackle. He's listed at 235, but D'Antonio said he's actually 250, which makes more sense. But he's an important part yeah, of this and class. I, and, I've also, and I've also seen some other things, other written elsewhere, that have him listed at 255. So um, he's an important, know, in terms of regional stuff. He's an important player in this class. Like you said, defensive line is so important, and there are not a lot of uh, you know defensive tackle type of prospects in this class. He is the one. Um I don't know how tall Jeff Piotrowski is. They list him as 6'2". You know, he played linebacker at Lakewood St. Ed's, 250 pounds. Piotrowski's an interesting one. As a linebacker, he's, you know, he's not fast enough to be a linebacker at this level. That In that way, he reminds me of a guy that played at Iowa about 18 years ago um, at the end of Hayden Fry, the beginning of Kirk Ferentz. Uh, a guy by the name of Aaron Campman, and he was... He tried hard, but he was too slow at linebacker. And he played linebacker on the late, great Hayden Fry's final teams, was not good enough to play linebacker and, and struggled. And I was like, man, this guy is not good. He's not an Iowa middle linebacker. Yeah, he'll never be nothing. Well, Kirk Ferentz put a little more weight on him, moved him to defensive tackle. He ended up getting drafted in the fifth round and played in the NFL for a few years, ended up being excellent. Uh, best case scenario, this Jeff Piotrowski is a linebacker who's not fast enough but he's rugged. He's got a, a tough frame, plays with toughness. Uh, listing him as a defensive end, you know, um, he, he's an interesting, interesting one. But I agree with you that Kyle King is the the one most likely to click here. An underrated three star, my my pick for the most underrated player in this class. Six three, two fifty, another rugged guy. Unlike some guys that can't turn the corner and run the hoop, he does have the ankle and hip flexibility to sports car around the end um, and, and, and make himself skinny and hard to block that way for a big, tough square, square guy. And, you know, he was well decorated in Indiana. The people in the state of Indiana that follow football know how good he is. And that program, New Palestine, is excellent in Indiana. That's a tough, tough program. And that's a guy that, to his credit, does not and will not come in with a lot of headlines and stars and bells and whistles, which is perfect for him. Give him a chance to find his way. And in time, I think he can be like one of the Slade brothers uh, and, and, and a little bit better. But uh, but you're, but the guy, Simeon Barrow, Michigan State fought off West Virginia to get him. Um, he's an important one. I'm not convinced he's going to really click at this level, but uh, he's a defensive tackle and they're going to need him to. I've been wrong before. He would be one that I would, I would rank in terms of confidence meter. Um, would be less likely 
to click. And as you know, you sign 20, everybody else signing in 20, 24, whatever they're signing, and everybody's talking about every single player in every single class. Rule of thumb, one-third of all of these players will fail to, to earn a letter at all the schools that they sign with. So one-third of these guys are not going to make it. So um, that, that, just, that just comes with, comes with the territory. That's, that's part of the task. And, Paul, you know that better than anybody. You've been covering this for a long time. The wide receivers, they needed to do well with wide receivers, and they've put themselves with all that versatility in a situation where they're going to be able to pick and choose, all right, is this guy an offensive player or a defensive player? You mentioned that about Terry Lockett. D'Antonio talked about Julian Barnett in that regard today. And, you know, Barnett played wide receiver because they needed him a wide receiver at the end of the season, did pretty well. Uh, that's going to be interesting to watch between those two and also a guy like Ian Stewart. You know, does he end up outside linebacker or safety? Ian Stewart, arguably the best in-state player they got this year. They listed him today at six foot four. Paul, he's been six foot three all along, and I messaged him to ask him if he grew at all. But that's a big kid at six four, one ninety six, with his ability to run and his pure football sense as a as a guy that just rolled out, just changed what he did and played quarterback this year to help the team. Yeah, I'm I'm close to six three, um, you know six two, and then I think the last physical I had was six three, so I grew an inch. Uh, but uh, since when it, you grew an inch uh, since last year? Uh, yeah, apparently. So maybe I've got a bunch of maybe I got a bunch of dead skin growth on my feet. But anyways, uh, just the the point of that me that me blurting that out was that Ian Stewart, you know, he's he's a tall kid. You know, it's not one of those fake. It's not I don't six three six four. I don't know, but it's not one of those. It's not one of those six one six threes. I mean, he's a he's a rangy kid with a good frame. I think he's I think he's one of the best all around athletes in the Midwest. I don't know where he plays. I've always wondered what would happen for, if Keith Nickel had played safety. Yeah, you know, or you know, or if he played quarterback at Purdue, he might be in the NFL right now. Yeah, I mean, maybe not. Well, David I, Blau know, here's is. The, here, here's here's the thing. Yeah, David Blau is. But here's the one thing that I've always you know, and I've watched more Lowell football than it, you know than most of the people um, you know that. Have, on our message board, probably most of them, probably almost everybody. But I'll say this is that the one thing that, you know, the one thing that he didn't have to do in that program and he had to do very little is, is make reads and, and change protections and all that, that, that kind of stuff. I mean, it was like, a, I mean, they did an awesome job with, with the same two receivers all the time. You didn't, you went where, you went where your basic read was taking you. So I don't know if you, I don't know what would have happened at a quarterback, but I do know that, you know, his senior year, they were working. They were thinking that they might run into to Ron Johnson from Muskegon, who was a top twenty recruit at that time. And so they had him working out at uh, safety quite a bit. And they played against Muskegon Reese Puffer, which is an overmatched op- opponent. But he was out there at safety. I'm like thinking, man, this kid moves pretty good. I mean, and they used they used Keith Nickel on defense to match up with Ron Johnson uh, when they were in the playoffs. Now they lost to that Muskegon team, and that was a heck of a Muskegon team that had uh, some D1 defensive linemen. They had a bunch more guys that should have been D1 but weren't qualified, but were like ineligible. Um, you know, couldn't pass through the clearinghouse. But Keith Nickel moved pretty well. Um, was pretty is underrated athletically i just think ian stewart's one of the best all-around athletes in the midwest uh yeah i think he's one of those guys if he had stayed with playing baseball uh he'd probably be drafted right now um he's a he's just one of the, you know he's a guy that it'll be interesting to see where he goes but i think he's got a good head on his shoulders i think he's a smart kid i think he's got a high football iq and i know he's a worker and uh and i think he's gonna he's gonna be one of those guys that kind of develops nicely within this program when you have that kind of size when you have that rangy frame you can do a lot of different things and uh and it's always uh, it's always nice when when you're not just beholding to one to one position i thought what you said about Barnett wait 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 who who would have been drafted in baseball i missed that Barnett, or ian stewart was a hell of a baseball okay. player all right he had the colorado rockies looking at him early before he stopped playing baseball all right and he, and uh you know he's the guy that, that stopped playing stop playing baseball to uh you know, it's a focus on football. I think he's just a great all-around athlete. All right, one more yeah, thing. One more. I got to stop you on the um, on the Keith Nickel thing, also, because uh, about making reads at Lowell and all those things. I mean, that's true of a lot of high school quarterbacks and high school programs and and, and things like that. Um, he came to Michigan State, played quarterback as a sophomore, did pretty well, and he was just a notch below Kirk Cousins. And look at Kirk Cousins today. Yeah, Tom absolutely. Brady. Tom Brady was just a notch below Drew Henson. I don't and, think and how, he was a notch below Drew Well, Henson. that's what we find. Well, Keith Nickel, 
was he a notch below Cousins? I probably was, but they they were that was based on four or five games when they were both sophomores. And hey, they did the right thing going with Cousins, obviously, and Cousins was great. And he and Nickel was just barely a notch below Sam Bradford, who wins the Heisman. Uh, you know, if you're just a notch below those guys, I mean, you can still go somewhere else and and become a Heisman finalist. We sent three of them right now. Uh, Keith Nickel did not fail at quarterback. He just changed positions. And I'm not going to be, I mean, and I, I, I wonder about that guy. Uh, you know, he's, he's doing well right now, but um, I, you know, I, I just wonder if that guy tosses and turns and, and just will wonder the rest of his life, how close he was to becoming a $20 million a guy, a year guy. I mean, I, I don't know if it would have happened. Um, there's not many guys that can play that position on this planet. And like I said, I was sitting there watching David Blau play an NFL game last weekend, undrafted free agent. He, he won't last long in the NFL, but no, you, you, no. but but um, you know nobody thought that uh, Tom Brady was going to last long. You never know. So it's it. But uh, Nickel was a great team player that helped hold, hold that team together. That helped uh, deliver that team up to you know what they did in 2010 and 2011. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, and you know, and I've had the most. I like Keith Nichol is a great guy. I've known him for known him for years. I mean, it, it's just it's tough to play quarterback, and it, it, you know, quarterback is all about you, you draft. I mean, you, you get as many guys as you can that you think can play play the play the play the role. I mean, you look at look at guys like Bradley Van Pelt and stuff yeah. like that. You know, it, it's another guy. But there's you look at you know one of, one of my good friends lives that lives in Georgia this year. He said you know on talk radio. Like, this year, I mean, the topic nonstop was, you know, about Justin Fields and, uh, and you know, Georgia letting him get away, you know, and, uh, you know, Georgia's got its, its own really good quarterback. So, I mean, there's there's not. Oh, there's not Jim, Ke- Jim Kelly and Jeff Hostetler were not good enough to be the quarterback at Penn State. And they went to Miami and West Virginia, and they were played in Super Bowls. Uh, there's a long, long list of them. It's a, yeah, it's a finicky I position. I can't remember the name of the third stringer at USC that got drafted the seventh round. And yeah, she stuck around in the. End. I mean, so yeah, it's it's a it's a tough, it's a position where where only one guy can play, and uh, you know, he said the same thing about Nick Foles. He had a hell of a career in the NFL, uh, you know, and and. You know, he didn't have a spot at Michigan State. So one more thing, I mean, Dan Lefevre, everybody thinks he's great because he went to Central Michigan, played in a new style offense at the time, put up big numbers, got drafted. Um, if he'd gone to Michigan State, would he have beaten out Brian Hoyer? No, he got an, he got a chance in the MAC and developed and put up numbers, got drafted, didn't last yeah. long, but got drafted. What if Lefevre? I mean, he wasn't recruited by Michigan State, but what if he would have went to Michigan State, and if Keith Nickel would have went to Central Michigan, would he have been better, a better Lefevre than Lefevre was? I think there's a real good chance he would have been. And he would have gotten drafted. I guess that's it's opportunities and, and and all those things and just how it all shakes out. Now, yeah, I wanted, I wanted to go back to Jeff Piotrowski because I, I talked to his high school coach a lot after his commitment, and I think the plan all along was they thought that he was going to be a, a you know a defense a pass rusher. They thought he's you know he's going to be a defensive lineman at Michigan State. I think when you talk about the like the read option and all the thing that things that guys have to do as a as a defensive end. You got to do a lot more. You know, it's not just it's just not just pass rushing. You have to have a linebacker skill set. I think that helps him. And, and he's the guy that was super decorated in high school as well. It's I mean, St. Ed's plays a great schedule, but he's a Division One uh, Player of the Year, Defensive Player of the Year in Ohio. That that says a lot right there. And, uh, and you know, I think that kids, well, all those Ohio kids are always all in kids. But um, he is one of those guys that is is beloved by his teammates. Um, he's a program first guy. I don't know what kind of career he's he's going to have, but um, you know you could do a lot you could do a lot worse than having guys develop into Marcus Rush type contributors. Sure, oh Marcus Rush. I mean, he was a, he was a, I mean, in some in some ways, Michigan State, you know, I mean, you know, has, has never really had to get that you know that that that, that, that Marcus Rush defensive. Defensive end. You know, everyone's always looking at well, when can they get the next guy that's better than the guy that they've got. And uh, I mean, to be a high-performing four-year player uh, like Marcus Rush was a guy that that did make it briefly in the NFL. Um, that's what this program has been built on. And I think you know, you look at when you see some of those Ohio kids like a Petrowski or, or like a Joe Bocci when he came in. Um, you know, those, those guys, for some reason, by and large, those Ohio defensive players overperform their recruiting ranking and I know there's a couple guys in the, in this class when you look at guys from Ohio 
that they just jump out at you as guys that might end up doing that. And I think you and I both feel really strongly about Angelo Gross yeah. uh, from Mansfield. I think he's got a chance to be that next. You know, where the heck, where the heck did everyone miss on this guy? You know, like a Josiah Scott. Um, he's he's just a tremendous football player. You know D'Antonio's record with three-star Ohio defensive backs. They go to the NFL. And Josiah Scott's going to be the next one. And uh, Angelo Gross is, uh, I mean, I think he should be a four-star. I mean, if, if Angelo Gross were playing um, in southeastern Michigan, he'd be a four-star. Um, just because he would stand out more. I think he's, I mean, a hitter. He runs. He's 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 tenacious football IQ, change of direction, the whole thing. Uh, great player. As far as Marcus Rush goes, <laughs> you know, when he left Michigan State, he unofficially held the school record in winning starts. Nobody ever started in more victories at Michigan State than Marcus Rush. And he was a four-star coming out of Moeller. I mean, he was a legit um, legit recruit. Michigan State beat out Michigan for him. Now, as far as, uh, you know, another point about the recruiting rankings and some of the reaction on our message board, um, another analogy that I made, and I wanted to point it out here, I made it on the board and people know where I'm going with this, but I want to repeat it. There were people that were, that cho- that, util- that used these, you know, being ranked number eight or number nine in the Big Ten as another reason to be angry with Mark D'Antonio. And I'm not here to defend Mark D'Antonio. I'm just trying to... Just trying to to define terms here. Um, Being angry at D'Antonio for being number nine, as if Michigan State lost to Illinois again today. Now, I just wonder with those same people in July and August when they pick up a preseason college football publication, when it ranks Michigan State outside of the top 25 or outside of the top 35 for publications that go that deep, when they read that in July... Do they get mad at Mark D'Antonio about that? No. They question the publication, right? Because it's somebody's forecast for that year. For It's an opinion on what they think Michigan State's going to do as a team. You might get mad at the publication. You might question it. But you're not going to get mad at Mark D'Antonio in July because somebody ranked his team number 36 in, in a preseason annual. Right, Paul? It's a human being making a preseason publication ranking. And that's what recruiting rankings are. It's human beings making a forecast for four or five years down the road um it these are forecasts these it's not a guarantee that michigan state's going to be the ninth best team of the big 10 four years from now i just now if those people are angry in august when they pick up a publication then i guess there's nothing i can say my guess paul is that they're not angry when they pick up a publication and see michigan state ranked low they might be you know frustrated with the program um, but it, they know that it's just a guess. Um, you know, nobody had Minnesota ranked that high this year. You know how college football works. It, 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 it's, it's different every year. That's why they play the games. So um, I'm glad that there's people out there that feel this strongly about things. I'm glad we have the lunatic fringe because that's, uh, that's what makes the website go. That's why we're in business. But I'm trying to help people utilize the information, maybe in a more healthy way. It's the, it's, you, these rankings are um, a gauge. They are an inexact barometer. It's a gauge for what the future might look like. It's not a guarantee for what the future will be. So use it for what it is. It's a barometric reading, and oh, by the way, it's the exact same reading that he's had five or, in five or six other classes in his 13 years. Enough about that. Um, as far as this class, um, in, in ways that it is similar to past, to past D'Antonio classes, I would mention that, that um, you know, you've got some highly ranked players at various positions. I mean, this class has the number one inside linebacker in Pennsylvania, Cal Halliday, the number one defensive end in Indiana, Kyle King, the number one wide receiver in Minnesota, the number one tight end in Michigan, who's also the number three tight end in the Midwest, the number two outside linebacker in Ohio, the number two corner in Ohio, the number two quarterback in Virginia, and what might be the best wide receiver class in the Big Ten. I'm not saying these are all four and five stars that are all going to be great guys, but it's not like they went out and rounded out the class with... uh, 
Suarez and Diego Akendo and some of those guys, John L. Smith, uh, you know, picked off the, the, the scrap heap just to just to, to finish up a class. Interestingly, Michigan State, you know, they signed 20 of these guys. I, I think like 17 of them had offers um, early on. These are guys that, that Michigan State, uh, you know, identified as people they wanted early on. Now, sure, there are a lot of other players that got away. There always are, and there were some some losses. I mean, Musin Muhammad, uh, you know, Michigan State never really got strongly involved with him. They tried, but he, he ended up at Texas A&M, and it, but Michigan State ended up with a pretty good wide receiver class. Anyway, in-state, Enzo Jennings, the defensive back out of uh, the Detroit area, I think Detroit Jesuit, uh, you know, ends up at Penn State. Michigan State was late offering him a scholarship, flat out. And D'Antonio told him, hey, when we offer a defensive back, we really take a look at it and we mean it. And D'Antonio offered him face-to-face, but they were already behind. And he said he'd take a look at Michigan State, and he did. But, you know, Penn State was um, is an attractive program right now, so they missed out on him, and you're going to miss out on players. Overall, end up at the quarterback situation, beaten out by Cincinnati for Evan Prater early on. They had a chance to get that Michael Alimo guy who um, – and he wanted to commit to Michigan State. Michigan State put him on hold, thinking they had a chance to get the uh, um, what Chubba Purdy, I think was his name, who ended up at Louisville. So Michigan State lost out on Purdy and then lost out on Alimo in the meantime. So Michigan State got reshuffled back to square one, took a look at Noah Kim again, a guy that went to camp two years ago, a guy that's been on the radar for a long time, a guy that played basketball for D'Antonio's brother in Chantilly, Virginia at the JV level. So Michigan State always knew about him. And they were always intrigued with him. He won a lot of games and had a long unbeaten streak. Took a team to a net, to a state title as a sophomore. Was in the state semifinals as a junior when he suffered a broken um, femur. Major injury. So that happens to him. So he's not going to any t-shirt camps. He's not going to any college camps. He's rehabbing all spring and summer. In the meantime, Virginia Tech thought enough of him to offer. So a guy coming off an injury, boom, he'll take that offer, right? So he commits to Virginia Tech. So Michigan State takes their eye off him for a while. The things happened with Purdy and Alimo and Prater. Okay, so Michigan State's going to look at senior film now, which is a good way to do things. It's the way they used to do it in the old days. Noah Kim comes out, doesn't lose any speed. In fact, he looks quick, um, has a very good senior year, gets him back undefeated record. Michigan State looks at his senior film during a bye week. And he's right back on it. They talked about it as a staff. Let's offer him. Boom, they offer. 24 hours later, he decommits from Virginia Tech. 72 hours later, he wants to be a Spartan. So uh, I don't, I'm don't. i not guaranteeing Noah Kim's going to be great, but he's an interesting guy to put in the talent pool, similar to, you know, somewhere around the, you know, the, the um, you know, somewhere between Brian Lewerke and Evan, or, and um, Peyton Thorne and, Actually, Tate Forcier, I'd put him kind of in that category. He may not ever be the guy, but he adds talent to the competition someday. And that's how Michigan State arrives at the quarterback, who's the number two quarterback in Virginia. Paul, any takeaways you had from what D'Antonio had to say today that, that caught your ear? Or any anything else you want to volley back to me about all that stuff? Yeah, I think that's interesting. I think Noah Kim is intriguing. Because they usually don't have, I mean, obviously quarterback height is not as big a deal with what your people are doing on offense now, but he's like one of the shorter quarterbacks they've had in recent classes. The other thing that's kind of interesting, well, he's athletic, but he's got to put on weight. So that's kind of like, the, I think the Tate Forcier uh, comparison is interesting. Uh, I think he'll probably work harder than Tate did Yeah. Uh, when, he was at, when he was in college, and he'll have to. I mean, that's the whole name of the game. I mean, it, it's about, you know, it's about half of the stuff with all these positions, some and, positions more than other player development. And look at the difference there. Noah Kim comes in here, you know, not many people know who he is, didn't get ranked high, no bells and whistles, no ballyhoos, no sirens. Tate Forcier commits to Michigan and he vaults up to a four and a half star and he is the, the one of many failed messiahs that ended up there. Had a couple of good games his freshman year. And then he was the next Tommy Harmon. I mean, that was a lot for that kid to handle. A year and a half later, he's he left and had serious, uh, you know, personal problems trying to deal with all of that. So uh, Noah Kim's situation coming in without a parade, uh, much more conducive to a nice, steady climb to give him a chance to maybe uh, compete to be the man someday. Go ahead, Paul. 
Yeah, there's a couple guys in here that I'm kind of intrigued by. I'm intrigued by Chris Mayfield from Hilliard, Ohio, a guy that didn't play a lot of senior, senior year. But, um, you know, D'Antonio was talking about watching him play basketball, how easily he gets up and dunks it as a kid that's 260. That, that That's something to watch. And, you know, all these defensive linemen, for the most part, I'm probably not Barrow, but some of these other guys are, are the guys that play – uh, play basketball and that type of thing. And I think that's, you know, I know that Ron Burton loves, loves those guys. I will say this for defensive line recruiting. I think that uh, defensive end recruiting and stuff like that, uh, um, it, defensive tackle recruiting, Ron Burton's got a, a good eye. But I think I think Chuck Bull has got a really good eye for talent uh, in guys that, you know, he likes. And, and when, you know, when I saw that Michigan State was involved with Kyle King, I knew that, that Bull liked him just like he liked Adam Berghorst during the recruiting process. And, uh, you know, Bull knows what he wants for uh, for the, the defensive line. There are a couple guys that I, I'm just not sure, you know, that every year there's guys that you're not you're not sure about. Uh, but, um, you know, Justin Stevens, that's a guy that you just don't know right. what's going to happen with that guy. A big mm-hmm. guy from Canada and Rangy hasn't played a whole lot of offensive line. Right. You know, when I saw, but last night, then again, I was reminded when I was talking to A.J. R. Curry last night, A.J. R. Curry was telling me that he he never played offensive line in high school. He was strictly a defensive, you know, defensive end. And he, and he was talk, talking about how, how tricky that was, kind of him making that switch uh, early on. And uh, we were talking about some of his kind of, you know, ups and downs as, as a Spartan. And I was telling him that, Hey man, it's good to see that you're in a position to stir. Cause I remember talking to your high school coach that when you were red shirt freshman, he said, man, AJ is this close to being a starter at Michigan state or getting on the field or being in that rotation. It, you just don't never know. Some of it's about, some of it's about frame and athleticism. Um, so I don't know whether all these guys are going to, are going to be, you know, good. Probably there's, like you said, thirty percent, and aren't going to aren't going to make it. But I think there's some of these guys that are going to outperform their outperform their rankings, and it'll be interesting to see which one which ones do. There are there are every year, and there are guys that you think are going to be really good that just aren't. You know, I think of T.J. Harrell. Uh, you know, that was a huge recruiting victory for Michigan State back. I think maybe 2011 or 2012. Mm-hmm. Uh, I thought he was going to be a really good player out of Ohio or sure. out of Florida that would fit that that would fit that star linebacker mold. Uh, he couldn't even get on the field, basically. And right. then you look at, you know, you look at guys like, uh, you know, I think it was uh, Khalil Gaines yeah. from down south. I thought he was going to be a good player, and he wasn't. Right. And, uh, you know, so a lot of it's like a baseline, and a lot of it comes down to work ethic. And, and some of these kids, there are, you know, you know, I always think of, like, you know, when Le'Veon Bell came in, you know, a guy that appreciated that he was going to get a chance to play, be a short yardage running back instead of having to play linebacker in Central Michigan. That guy brought it. He brought it every day. And uh, and it fueled him to become a you know to become a great pass protector. And I think the difference when I look at the difference between sometimes guys like Le'Veon Bell and L.J. Scott, you look at Le'Veon Bell as a guy that never had anything given to him, who was always undersold in high school, came in looking to prove something to somebody. And by that by the, the end of his first year, it was pretty darn clear that he was going to be better than uh, you know be better than Edwin Baker. You look at L.J. Scott, hyped as the next. Le'Veon Bell all through his high school career, and uh, he never even came close to it, you know. So, and he and, and, and he could have, he could have, but yeah, and that's the, that's the thing. That's my point. You know, he he's the guy that you know he's the guy that if he had that edge like Le'Veon Bell had had for him, had to him that when you're undersold, you know, when you're a guy like Joe Bocci coming in or something like that, and you're told that you're not good enough to play at this level, where you're a guy like J.J. Watt, you know, who walked out in Wisconsin told that you're not good enough or a guy like Kenny Willekes told that he's not good enough. Those guys work hard. Doesn't mean they're always going to make it. Uh, but there's a reason why, why there's all different kinds of shapes and sizes of guys in the NFL locker room that you wouldn't expect to be in the NFL locker room. I remember talking to, to Bart Scott, who's now with the NFL network. I think it was back when he was at the Detroit Southeastern game when I think, uh, when, uh, Fred Smith and, was playing playing there, and he was just standing, sitting in the stands, and uh, you know he was telling me about how the only person that even offered him partial money was like Southern Illinois, and how they never, no one thought he was going to make it in the NFL. The guy played for the guy played for a dozen years as an undersized linebacker because he had a big heart and he was tough tough as nails, and you know he got the most out of his God given ability. But um, every everywhere you look, and every signing day sheet across the Big Ten, you know whether it's Ohio State or Michigan or 
there's going to be guys that are ranked the, towards the end of the, the bottom of the class that vastly outperform what people expect of them. And, uh, you know, I think this isn't a great, this isn't a great class on paper. No one's trying to say it is, but I think it's, it's a class that's got, got some intriguing guys. And there's, there's really, really very few guys that I would say, say, man, I just don't think they have any chance. And, you know, I remember those years when you look at a Stephen Juarez or something like that. You mentioned that name earlier. Yeah. Some of those guys had no chance. Or that Jamar Jones, the guy Ooh. that uh, they like to bow hunt for pigs in uh, in Florida. With, you know, you look at that, a guy like that, and you're like, he's got no shot. And uh, there's nothing in this class that I would say, man, there's going to, you know, there's a Jamar Jones type player out there. So, you know, I think take it, take it with a grain of salt, but I think these guys fit. Like you said, they fit the the power for what what Michigan State has brought in over the years. Um, now it comes down to player development. You know, it comes down to Michigan State does a good job. They they do a pretty good job at evaluation. And uh, you know, one thing that did kind of stick out to me is the number of guys that play basketball in this in this class. And for some, I don't know why, but for some reason, guys that play basketball and guys that play basketball at a high level and continue to play AAU beyond their uh, beyond their sophomore seasons, those guys tend to get overlooked. You look at a guy like Elijah Collins, you look at Davion Williams, you look at a lot of guys over the years, those guys tend to, tend to get kind of like glossed over a little bit. And uh, I don't know why that is. For me, if I'm a recruiting analyst, I'm looking at it and I'm saying, okay, this guy plays is a starter for one of the best high school programs in the country in basketball, I'm, pay, I'm paying attention to that because that means a lot. Absolutely. And, you know, offensive line's been an area of weakness the last two years due partly to injury. If Michigan State had stayed healthy on the offensive line, I don't know if they would have been good or not. I would have liked to have seen uh, just because we'd have a better idea of where the program is. If those guys would have all stayed healthy and they would have been bad individually and as a unit, they would give us some answers. If they were good, maybe this is an 8-4 and four program three of the last three years. Um, so Michigan State, D'Antonio mentioned today, hey, we signed a lot of offensive linemen last year, including one that we moved to offensive line in J.D. DuPlain, you know, De- um, Devontae Dobbs played a little bit at left tackle. Nick Samak played a lot at center, started at the end of the year. Uh, you know, Spencer Brown is still back there, and um, when they signed him as a four-star, I thought he was a three-star project. Goodhart wants to do it, but uh, his film as an offensive lineman improved as he was a junior and a senior, but still just not a natural in terms of kick set and lateral movement and, and getting his feet and his hands in the same, you know, working together. But he does have a frame and some good straight line horsepower. And I thought back in high school, this guy's not an offensive tackle. He He's a guy that you put beef on him and he could be a Joel Heath maybe. And, you know, Michigan State had all those problems on the offensive line, had to move some true freshmen up there. And you hear things like, you know, Jacob Isaiah is close to breaking through. Um, Mustafa Khalifa got his shot and did not do well, but you never heard anything about Spencer Brown. Even when he enrolled early during the spring and went through spring practice, you didn't hear much. I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up at D-line in the spring, but the point is, he, I don't think that's an offensive lineman that's going to stick on offensive line. That's just just, just uh, an educated guess based on what I thought of his film and based on not hearing anything about him since he's gotten here. Um, my, my point is, they only signed two offensive linemen, Dallas Fincher, center, ranked pretty high. I'll have to, I've not looked at his senior film yet. I thought he was, you know, pretty good. Um, not, uh, you know, I thought Jacob Isaiah was more impressive with his high school film, and it's taken him a while to get going. So, you know, Stevens is a guy, the Canadian guy. I mean, that was close to a 10th hour type of situation. They looked at him. They're trying to decide whether to offer or not, and then they finally decided to go ahead and offer, and they got him. Was that because they didn't have a lot else to choose from? I mean, it's no secret Jim Bowman's getting up there in years. He's an excellent offensive line mind, very good on the practice field. I thought he did a real good job with Samak and Duplain getting a lot out of them and Matt Carrick early in their careers before they were ready to salvage some sort of an offensive line. And Bowman's work in the past has been really good. Um, question is, I mean, you know, it's really easy to negative recruit against Michigan State. And there are programs, plenty of programs that are doing that to Michigan State. You're an offensive lineman. You're looking at Michigan State. Really? Who's going to be your offensive line coach in three years? Are you sure? Michigan State's hearing that all the time. They're battling that all the time. And through all the recruiting process, we are hearing about players that came to Michigan State to visit for camps in June, uh, coming to games in the fall. And, Paul, they're just flat out were never many offensive linemen coming to visit Michigan State. So that was a problem. 
uh, maybe it wasn't a, you know, judging by what D'Antonio said today, maybe they didn't declare offensive line to be an immediate area of need for recruiting. There are indications that they're out there in the portal looking for one. In terms of recruiting losses, there weren't even many of those because not a lot of offensive linemen came to Michigan State to take a look around and then chose elsewhere. You know, Michigan State missed out on Joss Preby, offensive lineman from Edwardsburg, Michigan, ended up going to Northwestern. And for him, academics were a big deal. And, if you, you know, you're not going to compete with Northwestern's academics in, in, in most categories. So it's hard to argue with that. You know, um, you know, Grant Tutant, maybe he was the guy from Edwardsburg. Maybe I'm getting mixed up. He was committed elsewhere, ended up decommitting and going to Ohio State. Michigan State was never, didn't ever seem to be squarely involved with him. DeAndre Buford out of Detroit King goes to Kentucky. With the Curtis Blackwell situation, Michigan State was never going to get in on him, and Kentucky is using SEC um, recruiting. I don't want to say tactics, but you know they're. Uh, I'm not saying they're buying players, but they are creative, and Michigan State was never going to get that kid. They lost out. Michigan State did to a kid named George Sell out of Chagrin Falls, Ohio. There were a few players in Ohio offensive linemen. He goes to Wake Forest, so you lose out to Wake Forest. Um, you know, the kid, some kids from the west side of the state go elsewhere during a time when Mark Staten was demoted from offensive line coach through all of that and all that shuffling and all those moving plates. Not a strong year for Michigan State to recruit on offensive line. End up with Stevens. D'Antonio likes his measurables. I mean, he is a, a, a pure pros- project, pure project. A guy that really, really wants it, similar to Maverick Hansen in that regard. But uh, when I watch him, not real fluid, not real natural with his movements. Um, he's got some work to do, and he, he's willing to do it. We'll have to wait and see. But I don't think Michigan State saved many lives on the offensive line with this recruiting class. But like D'Antonio said, maybe it wasn't an area of need, but it's going to be an area of need real soon, and they need to get that figured out. Anything else, Paul, before we wrap it up? No, I think I'm set. All right, Paul, I really appreciate your help. We didn't go over each and every player. We don't want to do that. We just went over some topics that we would have talked about if we were over at Crunchy's with a, with, with some a bucket of beer um, talking about Michigan State football recruiting. Some things to be excited about. Ricky White, Ian Stewart, Darius Snow. That's one guy I wanted to mention because – now, this is interesting because when I watched his film, I was like, that's it's good. I didn't – I was like four star because he was a four star initially. Um, safety, I didn't really have safety speed. He's good, you know, good enough speed, safety, whatever, but not like difference making. Oh God, this guy's a killer safety, right? He hit well when he got to you, <clears throat> but um, when he committed to Michigan State, I described his lower body, his thighs were very similar to Percy Snow. Okay, more Percy Snow than Eric Snow, although he's Eric Snow's kid. So, um, you know, and Eric Snow. Uh, uh, has been a, a true Spartan for a long time. And that's how Michigan State, a big reason they got Darius Snow, huge reason, obviously. So Darius Snow came to Michigan State's camp. You know, he was all right, ran pretty well. I looked at his film, you know, junior film, like I said. I was not shocked that he went to the t-shirt camp down in Texas and was downgraded, you know, from a four-star to a three-star. I was not surprised. I didn't really argue with, with that. Now, um, because he doesn't really have that, didn't have, in my opinion, that natural change of direction at safety. I'm like, he's a slot linebacker. He is a slot linebacker, and I think he's going to be a really good one. That's what I would have, would have argued with Rivals.com about. I'm like, you guys are misevaluating him. He, he's listed as a safety, but he's not a safety. Look at him. He looks like Percy Snow. He's going to be a slot linebacker, and he's going to hit at that position, and he'll cover well enough. Um, I asked Darius Snow, are you a safety or a linebacker? And he was vehement. He goes, no, man, I'm a safety all the way. Don't even say that I'm a safety. I was like, okay. So that there, there went my argument about slot linebacker. Now, today, Mark D'Antonio mentioned that Darius Snow is 20 pounds lighter than he was. So I've not looked at his senior film, but to me, I was that's a light bulb. That was like an aha moment. Like, okay, I got to look at that kid again because there's a chance he's changed himself. And if he has then I'll backtrack on what I said about him not being a safety. He may very well have turned him into a safety with that weight loss. So that was a big thing that I learned today about a guy that's a, a, an important member of this class. Interesting that Mark D'Antonio compared him to Kari Willis, 
uh, maybe even more quick twitch, he thought. And he's familiar with the position, whereas Kari Willis was a basketball player and a tailback who really was, you know, just scratching the surface from scratch as a coverage guy, which we saw in camp, and he eventually figured it out, became an NFL player. If Darius yeah. Snow, if Darius knows another Kari Willis, sign me up. Yeah, and that, that's generous to say he was scratching the surface in camp. I remember Pat Narduzzi shaking his head watching Kyrie Willis work out in camp and being upset that they had off, they had offered him a, a scholarship. That was D'Antonio's call the entire way. D'Antonio was convinced that Kyrie Willis was going to be a difference maker. Nobody's got a better eye for that kind of stuff than D'Antonio, and Kyrie Willis is, uh, is going to have a long career in the NFL. Yep. Kari Willis struggled that day. They offered him anyway. I was like, man, I don't know. I remember you saying, man, I can't unsee that. I mean, he yeah. was he couldn't play. He 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 could not play defensive back that day. But yeah, and he ran he ran like he ran like uh, you know like above. I mean, he barely broke five when he ran the forty. <laughs> but you know what? His film, <laughs> the thing about him, in terms of high school running back film, that guy was just hard to tackle. Yeah, I mean, he yeah, was it was like. It was like tech mobile. I mean, you just, he was just shaking people off. And anyone that just has that ability, it's like, okay, I guess, you know, let's let's take a look at this guy. Yeah, and I remember talking to the, the Central – I talked to the Central Michigan DB, DB's coach, Pittsburgh guy. Uh, what's his name? I can't even remember that. What, Archie, uh, Archie Collins? Yeah, Archie Collins. I remember talking to Archie Collins off the record and uh, about – Kerry Willis, and he's like, yeah, he's like, no man, he's a he's a he's a running back all the way. He's a stud running back. He just, and then he, and then and, and then he might have been. Me, he might have been. Archie, if, and then and then Archie told me, he's like, hey, what you got to understand is you're gonna look really. I don't want to get the swear jar out, but he's what you got to understand is you're gonna look terrible trying to do DB drills at Michigan State in a camp if you've never done anything but play running back and play basketball. Yes. So give him give him time. And, uh, true. You know, so Archie was had a lot more patience than, uh, than Pat Narduzzi did because I think Pat was kind of disgusted. And you know I what? Like, and I, I wanted to remind Pat that he offered Dana Dixon. Oops. And, you know, um, Archie Collins might have been right about Kari Willis, that he might have been a running back. If, if Kari Willis had gone to Western Michigan or Central Michigan as a tailback, he'd have gained a thousand yards. I'm sure of it. You know, he's a good football player. But, the path to championships and a captaincy for a good team. Well, maybe not a championship, but um, to the pros was DBs at, at playing DB at Michigan State. So it all works out. But one path, some some of these guys have more than one path. And I'll, you know, I'll close with one other thing. Wide receiver recruiting, we talked about that. Michigan State did well with wide receivers. Some of these guys might not end up being wide receivers. But the interesting thing about all of that is as it was developing, I was really questioning – what Michigan State was thinking in terms of wide receiver recruiting because they took a circuitous route to get the players that they got. Some of them were, you know, 10th hour type of guys like Montori Foster. The reason it was strange is because wide receiver is the one position that the state of Michigan produces really well right now. When you looked at Malik Carr and Rashawn Williams and, you know, Abdul Rahman Yassin, you know, Michigan State had not offered any of those guys deep into the process and never did. They offered Yassin later, and they were talking with him late in the process. He ended up decommitting from um, Northwestern, ending up at Purdue. Christian Fitzpatrick, six foot four, Southfield, Michigan, ends up at Louisville. Previously was committed to Washington State. I talked to him at a camp in May. I said, are you hearing from Michigan State? He said, no. And he said it with a smile on his face and a shoulder shrug, like, what do they think? And I'm the, I'm the man. And I was like, well, I, I can't argue with that. You do look pretty good. But you know what? Michigan State ended up getting in on him midway through his senior year. Michigan State liked Ian Stewart. Ian Stewart was at Michigan State's camp. And they ended up going after him. Point is, there were a lot of wide receivers in the state of Michigan. Ernest Sanders, Michigan State looked at him. Kentucky came in and did their Kentucky, whatever happened there, I don't know. Uh, you know, Michigan State was in on the one kid from Saginaw. Ended up not having much of a senior year. Charles Rogers' nephew ends up going to West Virginia. Michigan State could have taken two or three of those guys and been stuck with guys that maybe aren't that good. But other ones, I think Malik Carr is outstanding. Michigan State went slow, slow, slow. Like Tyrone Willingham slow. We used to drive people nuts at Notre Dame the way he used to recruit. But I think all's well that ends well. And all ended very well with Michigan State by getting Terry Lockett. And then um, Ricky White having the senior season. He did. When they got Montori Foster, I'm thinking to myself, 
wow, Michigan State is painted themselves into a corner. They're taking a basketball player because they fell asleep on these other guys that I mentioned. Now I don't think that, but for a while I was like, this is looking like John L. Smith desperation, but it didn't turn out that way. As a matter of fact, the wide receiver class is holding a lot of promise. So that's recruiting. That's what it looks like. Not an exact science. All the things we've been talking about, we might end up being 180 degrees wrong on all of it. We don't know, but it's football and it's fun and we like talking about it. And that's the way it is right now. Anything else, Paul? No. For Paul Konerdijk, my name is Jim Copper, and you've been listening and watching. You know, Paul, this ends up being a one-hour VCast, like the old Skull Sessions. I guess that's uh, they get a little more um, a little more bang for their buck. Or if they don't like us, they had more misery for the buck. So either way, we appreciate it, people listening and downloading. We appreciate the SpartanMag.com subscribers. For Paul Konerdijk, my name is Jim Copperoni. You've been listening to the VCast, SpartanMag.com.